Hello, my name is Dr. John H. Braccio, psychologist. I'm most satisfied you've determined to listen to this audio recording of infidelity and the impact it has when you learn that you've been betrayed. It's really difficult. It's a very, very difficult situation. And I want you to listen to this, whether you're in your car, whether you're at home, just to get some feelings I'm sharing with you of so many people that I've known over the years in my work as a psychologist here in East Lansing about betrayal and how deep it runs. It's such a devastating thing. There are few relationships that have anywhere near the bond that a committed couple have, a husband and wife. And rarely do we see a mother betraying a child or a child betraying a mother or a parent. But spousal betrayal is sadly very, very common to a point that one half of all marriages entered into ends in divorce. So when betrayal comes, it's really devastating. And often the person isn't aware of it. Person may be, but often feels so alone and sadly is often the last person to know. And the whole life is just thrown into disarray. And often there's no one to talk to. We can get support sometimes from our children, but often they don't want to be involved. Or they say, we love you, but this is something for you to be working out. And often they are supportive, but then because of your loyalty and your love for the relationship between the children and the other parent, often you don't want to let the total truth out that your spouse has been with someone. And it can be anywhere. It can be at work. The relationship can be with someone they work with. And you may work together. It could be someone you even know. Because infidelity usually does occur when someone knows someone. When they develop a relationship with the person. And that's certainly what we're talking about the betrayal, the feelings that come with it. And I guess the question is, what do you do? Well, I think the first thing to do is face reality. Face your feelings. And whatever you feel you've done negatively in the relationship, and there may be many, and there may not, that's not a justification for the spouse having a relationship with someone else. So you have to face your feelings. Be aware of how painful it is. That's okay. And if you have people you can talk to, then do that. But it's very difficult, very, very difficult situation. And just acknowledge it. And, let, and be aware that's okay. It's okay for you to give credence to your feelings. Don't condemn yourself for not knowing. Don't condemn yourself for what you might have done. At this point, it really doesn't matter. There has been a betrayal. And then you, of course, have to gradually gain control of yourself because you really can't be out there out of control, falling apart, not able to function. And I'm not rushing you into this. Oh, no. No, no, I'm saying it's just something you have to gradually 
become accustomed to what happened and being able to really sit back, think about it, analyze it, decide what you're going to do. Because you can't let it destroy your life. No, you can't do that. Because you have a full life to lead. You have friends, very easily have children, whether they're younger or grown. May have a job, may have a lot of things. But as you gain control, you can more clearly analyze what are you going to do? Where are you going? These are really important things. But in order to do that, you have to really be able to take control of yourself. And if you're listening to these words shortly after the betrayal, the infidelity, then you're not to the point yet that you're in control. And that's okay. You need to take your time. Get these feelings out. And it can be helpful talking to a psychologist, talking to another mental health worker, meeting with a minister, a pastor, a priest, whatever your religion might be, family, because it's going to come out and you might just as well find family that you f feel you can trust and talk to. Some friends, be co-workers. Just be able to talk to someone or a few people where you feel comfortable that you can share, and you can let your feelings out, that you can cry. And it's okay, and it's all right. Then you have to ask yourself gradually as you go along, and after you talk to your spouse, if they want to work things out, if they want to change, if they want to never see the person again or minimize any contact if they happen to be in a situation where they work together, then you have to decide, do you want to stay or do you want to leave? If the person is already gone and isn't willing to work on anything, then that's good to know. And if the person says the person wants to, then you have to ask yourself, do they really? And you have to then really have discussion. Because if the person does want to work things out, you have to really ask yourself, do you want to stay or do you want to leave? What do you want to do? This becomes very important. What do you want to do? What works for you? You might want to stay for children, family situations, history together, financial reasons. There are a lot of reasons. But it has to be your reason. What do you want? You're not ready to be condemned and blamed by the person who's broken the relationship. If a person really is that unhappy in a relationship, then they have a responsibility to try to work that out with the spouse. So guilt is not the right thing for you to have, even though there may be things you could have done differently. But you have to decide, are you going to stay? Or are you going to leave? And this becomes very, very important. And this leads to the soul searching. This leads to talking to your spouse, assuming the person's even willing to deal with things. And the spouse may be in denial, which is really bad, saying, well, that never happened, nothing occurred here, even though in legal terms the word is res ipsa locator, the phrase, the facts speak for themselves. So you really do have to decide what you're going to do. and What do you really want to commit yourself to? Because it's very hard to get over 
get over what has occurred. And before you really try to resolve this, and that doesn't mean you don't try right away if it gets to the point where you feel something can be done and you want the relationship to work, you have to already be asking yourself for now and in the future, what have you learned? What have you learned from the affair? Were there signs at home, things you missed? Had it come to the point where you were just were roommates and there was really no real intimacy, no real communication? And if so, why? What might have been done differently? And it's not an excuse, but why did the person have an affair? Why did the spouse do this? What reason is given? Very important to know. And if the person won't even admit it, and you know it's true, and make sure you know it's true, can't be just some jealous thing that you think about. That even makes it more difficult because it's hard to learn in a situation like that because what do you learn? Well, one thing you learn is you clearly can't trust your spouse and you clearly know the spouse will lie to you. And that can be a deal breaker in itself. And if that's the case, it's very, very difficult because as you're hearing these words, and like say you could be listening from our internet download, you can be listening to a CD. Oh my. But that, that's really, I find, to be the toughest when a person is in total denial. And often that is the end of the relationship. Certainly, it's impossible to move forward. I've seen where people still stay in these situations because it works to their advantage. They just prefer not to have a divorce for whatever the reason. I'm not supporting that. I'm not taking a position on that other than to say I've seen it and I can certainly understand why. And often the person says, that's it, e finito is the Italian way, it's over. A terminado, the Spanish, it's over. And if it comes to that point, then fine, and learn from it. That's where you want to learn for the rest of the voyage of your life, that you don't get into another similar situation, that you don't choose or get involved with somebody who could be very similar. One of the big dangers that I find in infidelity, shockingly, the person who has been betrayed can often find the same kind of person, particularly someone they carry and they take care of or whatever it might be. But you want to learn. But let's assume there's a desire to work things out, really committed. That's when you have to find someone you can talk to. Both of you can talk to. It can be a minister, a priest, a clergy. It can be someone trained and working with couples. Certainly many psychologists work in this area. And social workers do. And there are people that certainly train counselors that work with this. And that's the main thing. Whoever you might be talking to in the mental health realm, that they are clearly experienced and are very familiar with working with similar situations. And then restoring trust. This is one of the most difficult things to deal with. How do you really restore trust when someone has betrayed you? kind of historically or from a literature point of view, we think of A2 Brute, the most famous assassination, I would think, when Caesar was killed and Brutus, someone he treated and felt like a son to him, when he betrayed him. And I'm certainly not trying to draw the comparison to a play. It's actually historically true, I believe, but the point being, it just shows the level of betrayal. How does one get trust back? Is it over? Is it dead to the point there can be no trust? A very good question. 
But if trust can be developed, and the two of you can really work on this, and you can develop trust again, and understand what happened, and understand why it will not happen again, why will it not happen again? And if you really feel comfortable with that and you're willing to take the voyage back, and oh, this is a difficult voyage, but many, many people do it, and they do it successfully. Some cannot, many cannot, but if you can, you then have to really work on this, and the relationship certainly will be fragile for quite a period of time. But you need to determine what will it take for you to feel you can have trust in the person. And on the other side, even if the other person is the culprit and is the person who broke the fidelity, you have to ask the question, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? And it can come to the point that you even do have a family meeting. There are times you can have children, adult children, and even older children, where you can have this discussion. That often is best done through a psychologist or a trained therapist familiar with that. But the main thing is, how does one develop trust? And it's very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. But let's just say you do get to the point that you have gotten together, probably shed a lot of tears together, have been in therapy, worked with minister, priest, clergy, family members, whoever it might be involved, and you develop the trust. Then then you have to really work on forgiveness. That doesn't mean you'll ever forget it. That doesn't mean images won't come to your mind. And I might add, getting into intimate details is really not useful, even though many times a person who's been betrayed needs to know so much more than they need to know. But... The main thing is, even if you don't forget, if you forgive, you develop trust. This becomes very, very important. And if you have spiritual views, this can be very helpful, believing that God puts you together and desires you to work things out. And even if you have a secular view, the idea that you're together and committed and made a lifelong commitment is a big reason if you can stay together and develop the trust to be able to forgive and move on. Even though, as we know, it's very, very difficult to do that. If you do get to that point, where even though the memories are there, that you have developed trust, and you have forgiven, then the important thing is to work on the relationship and get a renewal, get a new commitment. Marriage Encounter Weekends can be helpful on this times away. Develop a new dialogue, a new path, a renewal loaded with hope and the belief that things can work. And if you can do this, if you can do this, it can be very positive. I didn't say this is, I don't want to say this is easy. This is very, very difficult very difficult. I believe if you can listen to these words, which are meant to kind of get to the point, not meant to take the place of 
countless hours that you can read on this or listen to people talking about it, but just try to pick up the key points and listen to them over and over again and then have them apply to you as you adapt. We're first dealing with, for a little recap, the betrayal. The absolute devastation. The feelings that come with infidelity when a third person has entered into a relationship. The devastation, the horrible feelings. And then how important it is for you to be able to face your feelings. Come to grips with exactly how you feel. Give credence to your feelings. Don't run away from them. Don't run away from them. And then you have to gain control. Take control of your feelings, of your emotions. And that's a difficult thing. These take a lot of time. And there's no set timeline on it. But you have to know that you can do it. And you have to do it. In the middle of this, you do need to talk to someone yourself. You may have a few key friends, family, parents, even some children. Even though I find children really don't want to be involved. And maybe at this stage, the first step the first step is to gain control of your own feelings. And then after you have assessed the information, and after there's been the confrontation with the spouse, and the spouse has basically said it's not true, meaning they're in denial, even if you know it's true, or they say it's over and I'm gone anyway, or they say, I really want to work on this. I want to let this go. I'll do whatever it takes. At that point, you must decide. If it's over, it's easy. If the person's in denial, then you really do have to decide. Is there a reason for you to stay? Certainly not emotionally, but is there a reason for you to stay in the relationship? Are there reasons that could be at least temporarily your choice and not letting the other person make the choice. If the person really wants to work on things as contrite, admits the wrongness, then the decision is whether to stay or leave. And it has to be yours. It has to be your decision. And then as you begin working on this, and again, I state again, it can be very helpful to have experienced psychologist, therapist, who's aware of such problems and situations. Certainly clergy can also be helpful. And then if you can get through this and really work on things and sort out what happened, not the guilt from your point of view, but understand what happened and hear what the spouse says. Don't justify it under any circumstances, but find out why this happened and learn from it. Then if you can restore the trust, you can work on forgiving and moving forward and renewing the relationship. That, of course, is a very difficult task and can be very helpful. But if the person's in denial or the person doesn't work on it, then it becomes far more complicated. And I just want you to know that I've spent so much time working with people that have suffered from infidelity that have dealt with the third person. And many of them have worked things out, and that is positive. Many have not. I hope as you listen to this, you'll be one of the people that, whatever you decide, whatever the circumstances are, it's something that's going to heal you and make you feel better. And I wish you Godspeed to really feeling more comfortable and moving on in your life. It's Dr. John H. Bracho, psychologist. Our website is drjohnb.com. Our office number is 517-332-0153. Again, I wish you the best, and you're welcome to go to our website. We have a number of free downloads 
and podcasts from radio shows that I have done over the years. So again, the best is wished to you.